Hello, my name is Wen Ping Chen. I'm speaking from uh, Taoyuan, Taiwan, to welcome you to this NCU Delta lecture. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, a special event that we have the uh, award recipient, uh, Dr. Kasliwal, this time. And I would first introduce our director, Zhou Yi, uh, Professor Cho to give you the background of this award and then introduce the speaker, then I would host, I would share the talk. Please, Dr. Cho. <clears throat> Thanks, Wenping. Okay, first, okay, I would like to congratulate, okay, the Professor Kazaliwa from the Caltech to be awarded the 2020 Delta, uh, NCU Delta Young Astronomer Lectureship Award. Okay, that's the award established by the National Central University and Delta Electronics Foundation is to recognize the worldwide scholar under the age of the 45 who have made the outstanding contribution okay, in the field of astronomy and astrophysics. The candidates are suggested by the nomination committee okay, without regard to the sex, race, nationality, and the final list are chosen by the review committee. The review committee recommend Professor Kasliwa as the prize winner of 2002. Professor Kasliwa received her bachelor degree from Cornell University in 2004 and PhD degree in astrophysics from Caltech in 2011. She is now working as an assistant professor in the Department of Physics at Caltech. Her research interests are the astrophysical transient, EM counterpart of gravitational waves and sensors, and sensors of local universe. Okay, she has published more than 240 papers, okay, which is a huge number, okay, okay, in the refresh journal and make a significant contribution okay to the related field okay uh, as another okay lectureship winner okay professor kasliwa okay used to intend to visit taiwan unfortunately okay due to the covid-19 it is difficult uh, to do the traveling okay we therefore change her lecture okay to be here online in this year professor kasawadi okay, will give two talks the first talk is this one, which, okay, uh, Professor Chen, okay, will do the introduction. Okay, there, there is another one, okay, held, by, uh, held on the tomorrow, 10 a.m., okay, it's basically for the general public. She will talk about the cosmic firework, the explosive phenomena in the university, and you are also welcome to attend, okay, the lecture tomorrow. Okay, so, Okay, so let me okay give the uh, give the time back to the Professor Chen okay to introduce okay her talk today. All right, thank you very much, Director Cho. So let's begin the, the lecture today. Uh, Professor Kasliwa is going to talk about the dynamic infrared sky, describing her effort to move to the next step about the time variability in the infrared. So please, Mansi. Thank you so much for this honor and these very kind words. Um, my sincere apologies once again for the time zone mix up. Um, I wish I could actually physically be in Taiwan to, uh, to uh, celebrate this moment with all of you and, and share some of my research enthusiasm with all of you. Um, but um, apologies for having to do this remotely. Hopefully I can come visit, um, visit Taiwan soon. Um, I've been wanting to visit Taiwan for several years now because uh, uh, several uh, professors in Taiwan, Professor Chen, Professor Wingit, Professor Chao Chung Niu, they, they have all been fantastic collaborators um, for the work that I will be presenting today as part of this Wiki Transient Facility collaboration and the global relay of observatories watching transients happen collaboration. 
Um, I've had the opportunity to work with um, amazing astronomers in Taiwan, and I, I sincerely look forward to visiting Taiwan um, once the pandemic is, is over and, and travel is, is permit, permitted again. Uh, so I begin this talk with um, uh, pictures of my graduate students and uh, postdoctoral fellows. Um, uh, being at Caltech, uh, this is the biggest perk and privilege of, of the job I have, is to work with this bright group of students uh, and, uh, and uh, pursue our study of our dynamic universe. Um, and in Particular, I mean, this is all in the backdrop of um, multi-messenger astrophysics really reaching its um, its prime. Um, every two years now, there seems to be a major breakthrough in the field of multi-messenger astrophysics. Um, as you all may be aware, you know, in 2015, gravitational wave direct detection became real with um, the first detection of gravitational waves. Um, from uh, binary black hole mergers on September 14th of 2015. And since then, we now have dozens of binary black hole mergers that we've seen and uh, with extremely high mass ratios, one even possibly with an electromagnetic counterpart. Two years later in 2017, we saw the majestic gravitational wave event, uh, which involved the merger of two neutron stars into a black hole. Uh, and that lit up the entire electromagnetic spectrum. And I will certainly talk more about that today. And in 2019, we saw one neutron star and one black hole merge. Um, so there have been, I mean, these were systems that were unknown, unheard of until um, these gravitational wave interferometers turned on because they were not probed by any other piece of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and at the same time, neutrino astronomy has progressed in leaps and bounds. At the South Pole, there is the ice cube high energy neutrino detector. And we now know of two and actually three events now for which there are coincident high energy neutrinos with electromagnetic light. And one of these was a blazar. One of these was a tidal disruption event flare. And the third one that I speak of is yet another exotic act around a supermassive black hole. And time domain astronomy has not um, remained very far behind. In fact, across the board, across the electromagnetic spectrum, whether we talk about the radio or we talk about the X-rays or the visible, each of these wavelengths that have been orders of magnitude increase in our ability to map the dynamic universe and survey large areas at rapid speeds at very high sensitivity, unlike ever before. Um, and the one piece of the electromagnetic spectrum that I've been paying special attention to, and that will be the focus of the talk today, is the infrared. I feel that scientifically, the infrared has immense potential. Um, let me just give you three examples of the mysteries of the universe that, that get locked up in the infrared. And unless we have the infrared bands, they're very hard to uncover. Um, the first example is dust extinction. So many of the secrets in our own galaxy, many of the novi, white dwarf mergers, et cetera, they are just hidden behind sheets of dust. And these sheets of dust can be easily overcome if we have a long enough wavelength of light, such as the infrared, as opposed to get scattered by something like the optical. The second is certain stellar phenomena, in particular stellar mergers, or obscured supernovae that make up their own dust by uh, very large quantities and shroud themselves into a cocoon around them. And to get past this cocoon and to look for these exotic transients, once again, we need infrared wave bands to, to go, go through that cocoon. And the third example, uh, the one that I mentioned that was on the title of my slide as well, um, are neutron star mergers or neutron star black hole mergers. In this case, very fundamentally, um, we get very high opacity due to the large number of um, line transitions that heavy elements produced in these events have. So fundamentally, the, the hallmark signature of neutron star mergers and neutron star black hole mergers is rapidly reddening emission. And so the infrared again plays a very important role in these multi-messenger observations. 
That said, um, the infrared has not been um, an easy wavelength for us to uh, build wide field detectors and lots of um, uh, different, make a lot of progress very quickly. And that's for two very, very fundamental, very boring reasons, uh, practical reasons. And one is the detector cost. The uh, infrared astronomy has been dominated by mercury cadmium telluride detectors, which are just much, much more expensive per pixel than CCDs, because CCDs cut off at one micron. And the second is um, the sky background is just much higher um, in the infrared. So to get sensitivity, people have normally gone to space or, or, or you know, somewhere like the South Pole or any, anywhere in Antarctica would be, would be good here. So I suggest different ideas to try to overcome uh, the detector cost problem and the sky background problem to open up the infrared sky for exploration. So first, um, I'll, uh, let me just show before and after sort of for taken with the, uh, this is with the VLT. Uh, this is a piece of our own galaxy um, where you can see on the left an image in visible light and, and then a protostellar jet which is unveiled with an infrared image. So to overcome sort of the mysteries in our own um, Milky Way, the experiment that, um, that I wanted to build was very, very large field of view at any cost. It didn't, I mean, it didn't matter what the spatial resolution was. So in the optical, thanks to advances in, in Moore's law and a lot of semiconductor technology advancing and wafer scale devices becoming available, uh, there is now a nice suite of wide field um, optical cameras. And of course, um, uh, Taiwan is an, integrate, an integral partner in this Wiki transient facility, which is uh, shown on the right here with this 47 square degree field of view optical camera that we have in the Palomar 48 inch telescope. Now, what I wanted to do was build a ZTF in the infrared um, as well to complement and be the sister um, a survey to this Wiki transient facility. Except in the infrared, the biggest infrared camera that anybody in the world had um, was the, is the European Vista camera. This was when I started at Caltech. So the first thing I set out to do was build um, a project called Palomar Gatini IR, uh, which had a field of view. I couldn't do 47 square degrees, but I built 25 square degrees, which was about 40 times larger than the Vista camera. And how did I do this? Um, the idea behind uh, Palomar Gatini IR is that it's a small telescope. It um, has a 30 centimeter telescope with a very fast focal beam. So the entire telescope is just this, this piece here. That the front is just a baffle. And behind this very fast focal plane telescope is a single 2K by 2K standard mercury cadmium telluride H2RG detector. What we decided was that we could trade off um, spatial resolution for field of view. So each of our pixels subtends a very large eight and a half arc seconds on sky. And what we do is that every time we image the sky, um, we, we take not just one image, but we dither and take eight images. And by spatially dithering for eight images, we can watch the starlight um, leak in different parts of the pixels and use an algorithm called Drizzle to reconstruct the point spread function and recover the spatial resolution we need for image subtraction. But the large um, footprint on the sky, that 25 square degree footprint on the sky, allows us to map 15,000 square degrees every two nights to a J-band depth of about 15.7 AB magnitude. And uh, what this has enabled us to do is uh, detect something like um, uh, all types of infrared transients in our own galaxy. So for example, we uh, looked, there was a magnet of a fast radio burst outburst from SGR 1935. Um, soon after we commissioned Gatini with this very, very fast readout mode. So we were able to go and image these really dense um, galactic plane fields where this magnet happened at the same time as HXMT um, and the inside team were imaging that same magnet and while those flares were happening in the X-rays get very deep um, infrared limits on the counterpart emission. 
And what this tool does is that the radio detection from this galactic fast radio burst and the X-ray detection from the same galactic fast radio burst couldn't just be joined by, couldn't just be explained by a single simple power law because our, our infrared limits were deeper than that straight line slope that you may otherwise think of um, inferring from the initial detection of the really bright flare by chime and stair tube. In addition, um, what we found um, by in, in huge quantities are classical novae in our own galaxy. So classical novae are thermonuclear runaways on the surfaces of white dwarfs um, that become somewhere between a million to 10 million times the, the brightness of our sun. And we found these to be the brightest transients in the infrared sky. And yeah, you can see here um, the technique that we use, um, yeah, which, is, which is to take the image, convolve the image, map it to a reference, and then do the subtraction. That yields very nice residuals, even though our point spread function is quite complicated in shape over that large 25 square degree field of view. Yet these novae um, fall out very, very cleanly um, despite the crowded, extremely crowded fields, uh, this particular um, uh, nova is on just about one degree off, off from the plane. And consistently for um, tens of days, hundred days in this particular um, example, we are able to detect and double the discovery rate of classical novae. Now, classical novae are a historic, uh, um, you know, is a field that has been studied for more than 100 years now. We've been finding classical novae in our own galaxy. So what is it that Gattini could add to our problem? And that is the answer to this question of where are the classical novae located? If we just take a look at our Milky Way galaxy and we now weight, weight it by mass. So now the darker regions here are the regions of um, which have more mass. That is where you expect the novae to be. But until, um, until before Gattini's survey, um, if you took all the optical surveys combined, classical novae seemed to populate the entire region in galactic latitude and longitude. They weren't preferentially weighted to these knots in, um, in, in stellar weight where you might expect more novae than um, in the outer regions. Now in the infrared, these same mass weighted regions are also the regions which have the most amount of extinction, but the extinction doesn't bother us because of, of the longer wavelength. So what we were able to do, and as denoted by the star symbols here, is we were able to discover classical novae in regions that were previously inaccessible. So the classical novae actually traced the, the mass in the galaxy as one may theoretically expect. Um, so it could solve this long-standing problem, um, which in the words of uh, Nova guru, Professor Bob Williams, is that he's often wondered about classical novae, where are they? And the answer simply was that they were extincted. So we were able to then convert the discoveries of, by Gattini into a systematic rate of classical novae, of 46 classical novae in our galaxy per year. And we were able to do this by deriving the cumulative fraction as a function of extinction on the x-axis. And in the optical, this used to be a pretty shallow function and it was inconsistent with um, what the one may expect from um, the uh, ga galaxy uh, weight, which is shown in orange here. And with Gattini, I mean, there are a few different ways by which you could correct for extinction or derive this AV number, either photometrically or through the spectroscopic follow-up that we did. And both very self-consistently give us um, a distribution that is consistent with the orange line, which is the simulated and the expected distribution um, weighted by um, the galaxy uh, mass. So, um, this number of 46 um, uh, novi per year has been very well received in the, in the NOVA literature um, as it solves one of these um, open questions for, for many decades, um, just by opening up the dynamic universe in the infrared. Now, of course, there's more than um, just thermonuclear runaways on white dwarfs. We see white dwarf merger products, which are these are Corona Borealis uh, type stars. 
um, which my uh, second year graduate student Viraj refers to as stars with roller coaster light curves. Um, you can see how the light curves go up and down and disappear for hundreds of days. And that is because um, these white rock merger products are dredging up a lot of dust and material from inside the, the surface, as you can see in the animation on the right. And this dredged up material is, is leading to um, these long dimming episodes. Um, so we now have 149 new R4 candidates from um, Palo Margatini IR, and my student is systematically going through and spectroscopically measuring the oxygen 16 over oxygen 18 ratios to try to understand um, whether they come, all of them come from white rock mergers, but some of them come from final flashes. How does this compare with HDC stars, which could be another phase in the, in the life of a white rock merger? Um, and, and really trying to use um, a more complete um, statistic to, uh, to answer some of the long-standing questions in our um, study of, of white rock mergers. And these are the low mass white rock mergers which lead to these stable products, not the white rock mergers that could explode as a type 1A supernova uh, later. Um, then one more example I could give um, of the work that we are doing with Palmar Tini IR is finding some really nearby um, co-collapse supernovae. And anytime we detect a co-collapse supernova, um, another student who just graduated uh, last year, um, as of a or not, um, he observes these um, in the infrared with the Palomar 200 inch using a polarization instrument. Um, so he's able to look for asymmetries in the ejector in the infrared um, using a low resolution um, spectropolarimeter. And in, in the case of uh, one supernova, which is very similar to supernova 1987E, we actually see that near infrared uh, polarization at asymmetry. And even though the supernova is really far away, we can actually infer what the geometry was in the supernova thanks to the significant um, infrared polarization. And this infrared polarization has the advantage that it is less confused by um, uh, than the optical by um, other, um, uh, other sources of, um, of polarization like line of sight dust. So, uh, so that has been a nice follow-up um, project that has come out of Katini. Um, so I'd, I'd like to now move on to uh, the, this book. Katini was, in, in my mind, um, our first step. Um, this was together with Anna Moore at Australian National University, our first step towards opening up the, the dynamic infrared sky. But it was a pathfinder project. We wanted to build, um, and we are building now more sensitive um, missions um, in the infrared. Um, so let me give you some examples of, of what, what we could learn. Um, so first, let's look at the self-enshrouding problem, where um, if you have a stellar merger or an obscured supernova, uh, then you need very high sensitivity to look for these rare transients. So the best way um, is to, if you can afford to, we could just go to space and that would solve the sky background problem entirely. Um, and here I show you um, a video of uh, VA3 at Mon. Um, this is a famous stellar merger with two very massive stars that merged to form um, an even more massive star. And th this is a sequence of images from the Hubble Space Telescope where you can see how dusty and self-enshrouded um, the problem is. So if we were searching directly in the infrared, instead of following up with infrared images post facto, uh, we would be sensitive to the entire range of um, stellar mergers and, and even, even more massive um, mergers where the self-enshrouding could be even more of a problem than for VA3 at Mon. So for this, um, I did another sort of pathfinder mission um, with the Spitzer Space Telescope before it was switched off. Um, in January of 2020. Um, this was actually the topic of my first student's PhD thesis. Um, we spent uh, nearly 1700 hours with Spitzer, looking at about 200 galaxies over and over again, over a time scale for about six years. So we had cadence space line spanning one week, uh, 40 days, and um, one year and several years, six years totally. 
And what we found was that if you step back and you ask the question, what is the phase space of infrared transients? If you plot the infrared, intrinsic infrared luminosity on the y-axis, nu L nu at 4.5 micron, and you plot time scale, which is between 10 days, 100 days, 1000 days, so note that the, both the x-axis and y-axis here is logarithmic. Then in 2014, before I joined um, Caltech, the phase space was uh, dominated by infrared follow-up of optical transients. And the, the, the most luminous things were these interacting uh, supernovae. There were some co-collapse supernovae, some classical novae. Um, but there was a lot of sort of gap between um, the novae here and the supernovae up here. And with the spirit survey, which we did um, over uh, six years between 2015 and 2020, um, we found 80 explosive transients. And most of these were actually supernovae. Um, and some of these were in the gap between novae and supernovae. So I showed the spirits discoveries by the Spitzer Space Telescope, by the survey, which only probed about 200 galaxies um, using these orange, red, and purple stars, depending on the source of the uh, emission. And I bring your attention to the most luminous of these events, which were not as luminous as those interacting supernovae. But these things, when we went and got a spectrum for using the, um, the Keck telescope or the Palma 200 inch telescope, we found that these, these were definitely supernovae. So these were supernovae that um, in galaxies that were less than 20 megaparsec away. So these were galaxies in our backyard. Uh, but these supernovae were extincted by 8, 10, 12 magnitudes, or even more in some cases. So these extremely extincted um, supernovae um, told us that if you just measure the rate of co-collapse supernovae from optical surveys, we were missing nearly 38.5% in our backyard, uh, which is a very large number. And in fact, could um, address this, um, this problem of, of reconciling the local cosmic star formation rate, which always suggests that there should be more co-collapse supernovae than we were finding with the optically measured co-collapse supernova rate. Um, so this gives us a very significant um, tail um, on the extinction and the most extincted supernovae, possibly due to self-obscuration, possibly due to these violent episodes of mass loss before the final explosion. Um, and this is, could be the source of um, the extinction from uh, supernovae, uh, which could be giving explaining these obscured supernovae. And so as part of uh, my student's PhD thesis, he um, derived the rate of these obscured supernovae in the redis bands at 4.5 micron. So now I'd like to draw your attention uh, to these two points here, which are squarely in the gap between novae and supernovae. And these two points detected by Spitzer are the two detections we have in the mid infrared for the gravitational data event from August 17th, 2017. So now I'd like to turn my attention to opacity and to neutron star mergers and what we can learn from them with sensitive infrared surveys. So as I mentioned before, infrared is very powerful in overcoming bound bound opacity. So normally when we have a supernova uh, explode, we have ion group elements. And ion is, is not, um, doesn't have that many um, uh, electrons in, in that many shells, right? So the opacities that we are seeing are of the order of about one centimeter square per gram. And they're very manageable. You can see the emission in, in uh, very easily in the optical. So what I was describing here um, was uh, now the third piece of what the infrared can unco uncover for us, which is bound bound opacity. So, so far when we were talking about novae, supernovae, uh, we are talking about very light elements, um, so elements um, which were um, as massive as iron or lighter. So the opacities we were working with were one centimeter square per gram. Now, in the case of neutron star mergers and neutron star black hole mergers, we are filling out the S, P, D, F shell. And uh, so uh, the quantum numbers we are working with are now 14 and 14 factorial. So the electrons have millions of possible line transitions. 
So the in inherent opacity here, the bound bound opacity in the problem is now 10 centimeters square per gram. So the photons that are emitted from radioactive decay of these very heavy elements that are produced in neutron star mergers have a very difficult time escaping. So we need a uh, need as sensitive a red probe, but an infrared probe, if we can uh, have it, to be able to um, uh, uncover uh, the heavy element production by the R process nucleosynthesis in neutron star mergers. And we saw this um, in all its glory in um, the gravitational wave event from August 17, 2017. This event was um, uh, amazing in that both gravitational waves and the electromagnetic spectrum were seen from the same source at the same time. So all the elements that you see in yellow here on the periodic table on the left um, were seen to be synthesized by our process nucleosynthesis and only theoretically uh, from neutron star mergers. We'd had the first direct evidence for our process nucleosynthesis from neutron star mergers from this event four years ago on August 17, 2017. And what you see on the right here is the jet physics that we were able to extract from this event, um, where you see energetics on the left panel and kinematics on the right panel. So that's log four velocity. Um, so Lorentz factor into beta on the right axis. And what we saw in this case was that while the two neutron stars were merging, they were stripping up so much material um, that the jet that get, got launched actually did not escape immediately that jet actually transferred its energy into the surrounding material, forming a wide angle, mildly relativistic cocoon. And this wide angle, mildly relativistic cocoon with a Lorentz factor of somewhere between a few to 10, and you can see the distribution in the color coding here, that wide angle uh, uh, cocoon, when it broke out, that is what gave us these gamma rays that were a factor of 10,000 weaker than any other short gamma ray burst that we had seen before. So that was absolutely unique about this event from the get-go, that the jet physics involved not just a jet, but also the formation of a cocoon and the breakout of a cocoon. And we could study this in the gamma rays at the beginning and then the X-rays and the radio for hundreds of days later uh, to um, unravel all the different pieces of jet physics associated with this event. And here, um, the growth collaboration uh, that I was uh, very grateful to, uh, to uh, be a part of here, um, uh, which is the National Science Foundation Partnership in International Research and Education, played this amazing role of having a ring of observatories around the world. So um, as the sun sets in Palomar, we can move westward to Hawaii. Um, and then westward to Japan, Taiwan, India, Israel, and Sweden. And once again, I'm very grateful to my collaborators in, in Taiwan um, for their wonderful contributions to this network um, for many science topics that we have studied together, um, including uh, the neutron star mergers, but also many, many um, fast moving asteroids, young supernovae, galactic uh, stellar variables uh, that we've studied jointly um, as part of this international collaboration. Um, so uh, for this neutron star merger from uh, 2017, uh, we, uh, in the first three weeks after the merger, we published three papers in science jointly um, as part of the 2017 Breakthrough of the Year issue. And the, the most um, uh, striking uh, clue that we had of the formation of heavy elements, of all these elements in yellow that were being formed, was the ultraviolet optical and infrared light curve. Um, in the ultraviolet, the emission for that was detected by the first by the Neil Gerald Swift satellite and then by our triggered observations of the Hubble Space Telescope decayed in just a few hours. The optical took a few days, which are these magenta lines here. The infrared took several weeks. And so this here is the hallmark rapid reddening signature of our process nucleosynthesis of this very high bound bound opacity of 10 centimeters square per gram, which can only be explained by the production of um, the heaviest of the, the heavy elements here. And the infrared, if you look at the, how the spectra evolved as a function of time, this really hot and blue transient very quickly faded into a much longer lived um, redder glow. And, and uh, you can see 
Even today, there's the spectral features are much debated, but um, it, uh, it appears that elements such as neodymium, um, which are part of the lanthanide series, are essential to explaining the, uh, the spectrum, um, spectral features. Now, there's also much debate on whether uh, neutron star, neutron star mergers are one of the sites of heavy element production, um, the or the only site, or or uh, or um, one of many different sites. And this brings us to the heart of the question of whether the um, the large numbers of heavy elements produced, whether they form the same abundance pattern as what we see in our solar neighborhood. Because if it was the one and only site of our process um, production, then this abundance pattern that we see in our own solar neighborhood should be identical to what was produced in that neutron star merger. And one way to probe that is again using the infrared. Um, as you can see on the plot on the right here, uh, most you, this is a logarithmic abundance plot. So actually, 70, 80% of the abundance is actually in that first peak, in that first row of the periodic table, um, which has um, yellow elements, right? Elements produced by the R process. Um, but that same lightest of the uh, R process elements are sh shown by this green line. And they uh, all have half lives, um, radioactive half lives, such that the fraction of electron heating that's contributed by these elements drops off in about one month. So if you look beyond one month, um, so this is the 30 day mark here. Uh, this is also a logarithmic plot. So this is the 30 day mark here. If you look beyond the 30 day mark on the right, any emission that is seen beyond one, one month, between one month and say three months is only possible um, to explain with elements from the second peak, the third peak, and the lanthanide peak. Mm -hmm. So if you want to ask the question of whether the heaviest of the heavy elements were produced, um, this comes from um, the two points that I highlighted in Jacob's thesis plot, um, which is the detection um, of this red emission um, from GW170817 by this with the space telescope at 43 days and 74 days after merger. Now, uh, the 74 day emission is marginal, I, I admit, but the 43 day emission is robust enough that it is a, a, our only direct clue that the heaviest of the heavy elements um, were indeed synthesized. Now, I hope very soon um, the James Webb Space Telescope will be launched. And, um, and with that, we, are, we would be able to actually get a spectrum of um, in the middle infrared at the space of 43 days. And in our paper on this object, we actually narrow down the list of elements that could explain that very late time, very red emission to these eight elements, which have the right half-lives. Um, so if James Webb gets a spectrum and you see a lot of neodymium or thorium or europium, then, then, we, then you know that, uh, that the heaviest of the heavy elements were indeed synthesized. And um, likely this is um, the, the distribution, um, abundance distribution is um, what explains the, uh, all of the yellow elements that we see in our own solar neighborhood. Um, now, since uh, 2017, um, there, have been, uh, there has been an entire observing run um, by LIGO Virgo, where there have been 13 additional triggers um, of binary neutron stars, five binary neutron star, and eight neutron star black hole mergers. And this was a very difficult um, observing run because uh, the gravitational wave interferometers became more sensitive. Um, but at the same time, the localization, the median localization, instead of being 40 square degrees, which is what it was for GW170 and 17, was nearly 4,480 square degrees. Now, um, these are so large that, um, uh, you know, despite this large localization, uh, the large field of view of uh, ZTF um, was actually able to map these large areas to look for any associated electromagnetic emission. So you, here you're seeing a simulation of how we map these large areas and we map them within a few hours after merger at Palomar, uh, just because of the location, we could really access this, these areas very quickly. And we found um, that we needed to um, corral um, a very large amount of follow-up um, and coordinate all of this very well with a lot of uh, machine learning tools and software tools and follow-up telescopes around the world, including at Taiwan, to understand what is it that, that we were finding in these large areas of thousands of square degrees that we were mapping. 
And so in these 13 triggers that we received in O3, there were 2.1 million alerts of, um, which is anything that changed by more than five sigma in, um, in, in time or in space. Um, so from these 2.1 million alerts, thanks to this multi-step machine learning, we were able to whittle down the list of possible can candidate counterparts to about 2,199. Further, um, with, um, uh, with uh, some um, uh, human vetting and looking up uh, context, context information from different archives, we were able to su su sub-select this to 127 high-value candidates that we announced immediately through um, to the astronomical community via GCN circulars. And at that point, we began a lot of follow-up uh, spectroscopy, as well as a lot of follow-up photometry with many telescopes, including, um, the, including Taiwan. And only 14 um, were remaining after the follow-up photometry. And we could then rule out, based on photometry and spectroscopy, all the candidates and conclude that zero candidates were, in fact, associated with the gravitational wave events from 2019 and early part of 2020. So what does this mean? What does non-detection um, or an upper limit mean? Um, it goes to the heart of the question of whether or not this, this absolutely majestic event that we saw on August 17, 2017, whether that's the norm or the exception. So what we did was we converted our upper limits into uh, a constraint on the intrinsic luminosity function of kilonovi. And it seems that about no more than half of the events could be as bright as GW170817, because the probability that we see zero events after following up 13 triggers is less than 4%, the joint non-detection probability. So, so this really speaks of the underlying distribution in the luminosities of the kilonovi being biased towards um, a significant fraction being in, on the faint end, fainter than GW170817. It also constrains the rate. Um, so very early on, even with the Paloma transient factory, um, we knew that if there was an event like GW170817, and that was commonplace, that happened all the time, we would be sensitive to it. And with the Zwicky transient facility now running for three years, we know that the rate cannot be more than 900 per gigaparsec cube per year. Um, because we are, even when the gravitational event interferometers are off, we are continuously searching for events like GW170817 um, to see how many other such events could possibly be out there. And the latest estimates from the gravitational wave interferometers also came up with this rate of between 80 and 810 per gigaparsec cube per year. So the rates have continuously gone down from an upper limit of 5,000 to 3,000 to now 800. Um, so there's still an, a factor of 10 uncertainty here, but once the interferometers turn back on next summer, we will certainly know more. So how do we now, uh, so we, I spoke about two pathfinding missions, right? I spoke about the Spitzer Space Telescope and a small survey with that called Spirits. Um, and I spoke about the Palomar Gatini IR project where we were using very coarse pixels but software tricks really to, to reconstruct the point spread function to get our large field of view. But how do we get both sensitivity and large field of view at the same time um, so that we can actually have an infrared probe to detecting neutron star black hole mergers. And these neutron star black hole mergers are completely real because in 2019, on April 26th, we saw the first neutron star black hole merger. On August 14th, 2019, we saw um, a very well localized neutron star black hole merger, but this actually later um, uh, uh, was revised to be um, uh, so high a mass ratio uh, that it was likely a binary black hole merger, like two black holes, not a neutron star black hole. And that actually more easily explains why we see absolutely nothing um, in either the deep optical searches or the deep radio searches for this event. Um, there are only two explanations. If it was a neutron star black hole merger, then the neutron star was swallowed whole by the black hole. Or the simple explanation for this event is that it was a black hole black hole merger. Uh, with this ex very extreme Q, very, very extreme mass ratio here. So um, to look for um, counterparts to um, uh, neutron star black hole mergers with more manageable mass ratios, like the two events from January 2020, we really are focused on the infrared emission because that's luminous, that's long-lived, 
um, that is not as uh, dependent on the geometry and the viewing angle. You could be looking from any direction and we could uh, probe much higher mass ratios, uh, much shorter lifetimes of that remnant before it collapses to form the black hole. Um, so theoretically, it's a much more ubiquitous and sensitive probe. So what we've done is built two, um, uh, two sister instruments, the Winter Telescope at um, Palomar Observatory. This is in partnership with uh, Professor Rob Simcoe at MIT and the DREAMS instrument at um, Siding Spring Observatory in Australia. So the latitudinally and longitudinally distributed. Um, and this is in partnership with Professor Anna Moore at ANU. And instead of the sticking to this mercury cadmium telluride technology that astronomers have used forever in the infrared, um, we are leveraging in-gas semiconductors. Um, Professor Simcoe in his lab demonstrated that you can use these otherwise, you know, not very uh, notorious detectors, which have the high read noise and high dark current. It turns out the read noise, the extra read noise and extra dark current doesn't matter when we are imaging because we are completely dominated in our noise budget by the sky background. Um, but what these in-gas detectors can do for us now, we get them in this 2K by 1K format that are completely buttable. So we are able to build a continuous focal plane like that, like I show here for winter. So back to back to back um, detectors. So we are able to get a, um, a one, point, one arc second per pixel detector with a 1.1 square degree field of view. And instead of putting it behind a 30 centimeter telescope, we are now putting this behind a one meter telescope. And in fact, uh, just in summer of, um, in June of uh, 2021, just a few months ago, when the observatory finally opened after the pandemic, we successfully installed the telescope at Palomar. Um, so the hope is that with both winter and dreams working for the fourth observing run, the next observing run for um, uh, advanced LIGO and Virgo, we are able to tackle this question of neutron star black hole mergers. And uh, just in the last few minutes here, um, I wanted to speak about this dream of um, going to Antarctica in the next few years, and in particular in Antarctica uh, to Dome C, um, where the sky is a factor of 40 darker, the seeing is a quarter arc second, and we have just overcome two major technology challenges, um, which is push the quantum efficiency of these um, uh, MBE and silicon detectors to um, this key dark band pass, right, which is right around this uh, 2.35 uh, micron here, um, uh, where the sky is darker than anywhere else on Mauna Kea, anywhere else on Earth, right? Um, uh, so with these detectors and with this fully cryogenic telescope system that, uh, um, that Roger Smith at Caltech has designed, um, this is where the telescope and the detector are completely cold, we finally have a thermally stable solution to building a telescope like this at Dome C in Antarctica. So the cryoscope uh, prototype, it's a quarter scale prototype. We are hoping to take this to Antarctica sometime um, next uh, December, so December of 2022, um, and then build a full scale system um, which would be a, something like a one meter telescope with a hundred square degree uh, camera um, with these MB on silicon detectors, taking advantage of um, the darker sky in Antarctica uh, sometime in the mid 2020s. And so with that, uh, I sincerely apologize for uh, the uh, Wi-Fi problem and the, uh, the delay in the start. And I'm happy to take any questions. Mm -hmm.